From KYMA Studios, this is Nightside with Christy Rodriguez and Michael Coliani. A massive dust storm rolled into Yuma before 5 this evening, bringing with it thunder, rain, hail, and winds so heavy they knocked down several power lines, turned a semi-truck on its side, and dragged a mobile home to the middle of the road. Thank you for joining us tonight. Monsoon season showed its face for the first time in close to a month in arguably the strongest set of storms of the season thus far. News 11's Rob Fram has been tracking the storms all afternoon and into the night. He joins us now with the latest developments. Rob. Well, guys, the good news is things have lessened considerably within the past few hours. But in the meantime, as we take a quick peek with your SkyCam view, Yes, the calm after the storm, as you will. But as we take a look at your local radar and satellite, earlier today, we've definitely had a lot of pick-me-up activity over in Pima County. And as you can see, as the course of the evening has worn on, things have worn out considerably. Maybe just a little bit of activity south of Imperial County at this hour. We did still have some pretty strong storm developments down there, but that is also beginning to wane a little bit more. And over in Yuma County, this is where the bulk of our activity was earlier tonight. We're talking about the hours between 3 o'clock and roughly 6, 7 o'clock this evening, where the outflow even affected folks over in the Imperial Valley. We're talking about 6.45 to about 7 o'clock, where that dust really started flowing in and around the Holtville area, as well as Imperial, El Centro. So many of these areas affected with limited visibility down to a quarter of a mile, and of course, wind gusts up to 50 miles an hour as well. So we take a closer look at what we've seen really over the course of the last few hours going from 1.30 on, really not a lot of pick-me-up until after the fact. You can see really has developed quite strongly. And then as the evening goes on, without the power of the sun and the heat of the sun, things have worn down significantly. Coming up my forecast, we'll let you know more of what we're going to be expecting and why we're not in for a quiet weekend. It's coming up my forecast in just a bit. All right, Rob, thank you so much. We will check back within you, uh, with you in just a bit. Well, now that the most serious weather has moved on, we can look back at a storm that certainly left its mark. Now, while the storm settled over the city of Yuma for no more than a few hours, it was quite a memorable first major storm of the monsoon season. What's left of the Best Western Hotel sign on 4th Avenue and 3rd Street after a severe dust storm hit the city of Yuma Thursday evening. Firefighters rushed to the sign for fears that it would collapse and damage buildings nearby. Coupled by thunder, lightning, and flash floods, this mobile home fell victim to rapidly flowing waters, carrying the camper out into the middle of the street. And this is a time-lapse video taken by the News 11 Skycam of approximately five minutes of video over 15 seconds. You can see two large waves of dust as they blanket the city over a two-hour period between 445 and 645. Visibility was down to less than 50 feet on some roads. At Arizona Western College, hail interrupted the Lady Matadors soccer team's inaugural game, forcing players and spectators inside in a matter of seconds. This picture of a semi-trailer flipped on its side on Interstate 8 was sent in by a KYMA viewer during the peak of the storm. While it has been somewhat of a quiet monsoon season so far here in the desert southwest, storms like these are reminding residents of the significant powers of Mother Nature. Well, the first major storm of the year was certainly noteworthy. We aren't out of the woods just yet. The monsoon season is not officially over until the end of September. No, it certainly is not over. And unfortunately, there have already been reports of damage around town, including a tree that fell into a house. News 11's Nico Santos spoke with the homeowner who says she's thankful it just wasn't any worse. He now joins us live in the studio. So, Nico, what was going through the owner's mind when she heard the crash? Thanks, guys. Well, Mercedes Thomas owns a house in the Baxter neighborhood in Yuma. When the tree crashed into her home, Mercedes says she panicked and immediately grabbed the phone to call for help. Oh, that would never happen to my tree. I mean, I thought mine was solid because it was here before I bought the house. It looks like Mercedes Thomas will have to get used to a home with a lot less shade. I'm sad because I won't have any more shade, but... I just thank God that my house is still standing. Thursday night's monsoon storm almost completely uprooted this tree, knocking it onto her house. When I bought the house, the reason I bought it was because it was shading the whole house. Mercedes doesn't know how old the tree is, but she's lived here on 8th Avenue in the Baxter area of Yuma for 13 years. 
She says she'll miss her faithful foliage. Nonetheless, she's counting her blessings. If it had fallen this way, it would have come right into my living room, and I was sitting right here. So I'm thankful that it fell to the side and just got my porch. Mm -hmm. The insurance companies are going to have a, a, a busy time tomorrow with people calling from all over. Now, fire crews and a structural engineer from the city responded to make sure no power lines fell. Mercedes says they gave her the okay to stay in her home tonight. Unfortunately, the tree has to go. Live in the studio, I'm Nico Santos, News 11. Back to you. All right, Nico, thank you very much. Well, we're going to update you now on all of the power outages and other local authorities' advisories. News 11 just spoke to APS. They tell us 12,000 customers are without power as of this moment. The majority of those customers are in the Foothills area. There are at least 50 down, down power lines, mainly in the Foothills area as well. APS tells News 11 many of the customers will not have power until tomorrow morning at the earliest. APS crews from Phoenix are on their way to help with the repairs. We'll have more details from APS as soon as they become available. And just another quick note here. We do want to let you know that San Pasquale is the only school that has notified us that they are going to be closed tomorrow. They will not have class tomorrow. Otherwise, every other school in our area so far uh, has not advised us, or at least YUHSD has told us they will have classes tomorrow. Otherwise, uh, you should be on the lookout to see if the school will notify you. But for now, that is the only school that's advised us that they have canceled class tomorrow. Yeah, sorry, kids. Most of you are going to have to go to school tomorrow. Right. Well, moving on, the man arrested in connection with a fatal hit and run was back in court today. Yeah, now Edgar Borges is facing multiple felony counts in connection with the hit and run that killed 14-year-old Mary Rodriguez. 23-year-old Edgar Borg has listened as the judge read off all seven felony counts against him, including second-degree murder Thursday. Borges was arrested in a hit-and-run case that killed 14-year-old Mary Rodriguez. He is facing second-degree murder, leaving the scene of an accident causing death or injury, endangerment, and four separate DUI charges. Also in court today, Borges' parents, Guadalupe and Olivia, who were formally charged with four felonies each, including hindering prosecution and tampering with physical evidence. Prosecutors allege after finding out about the incident, the pair tried to dismantle the car. They also say Guadalupe and Olivia plan to drive the car to Mexico, which the defense denies. I'm at risk because there are no allegations that they tried to do that. There were some things they may have done to hide evidence tamper with evidence, but clearly there should be no concern um, that my client would intend on leaving this community and not facing these charges. Both are being held on a $100,000 bond while their son Edgar is in jail on a $650,000 bond. Edgar was ordered not to have any contact with his co-defendants, in this case his parents. They are all due back in court later this month. Well, the family of Mary is inviting anyone who knew her to partake in her funeral services. The viewing will be held this coming Monday from 5 to 11 p.m. at Desert Valley Mortuary. Then on Tuesday, there will be a church service starting at 10 a.m. at Mount Zion Church. It will be followed by the burial. Well, a man is stabbed while filling fuel tanks at a gas station in Yuma, and the suspect is still on the run. Yuma police say it happened last night before midnight at the Chevron located at 1825 South 4th Avenue. Officers found the 47-year-old victim bleeding from stab wounds when they arrived. He was taken to Yuma Regional Medical Center with serious injuries. Now, the man who approached and stabbed him is described as a Hispanic man in his mid-20s, about 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighing 170 pounds. He may be bald or have very short hair with a mustache. He was last seen wearing a black shirt with a white logo and black basketball shorts that go below his knees. If you have any information on this case, call Yuma Police or 78 Crime to remain anonymous. A $1,000 cash reward is being offered for information leading to an arrest. Well, Yuma police are also continuing their investigation into a home burglary where 55 firearms were taken. Two people have been arrested in connection with that case. They are 44-year-old Tell Wagner and 34-year-old Rebecca Young. Police say they found the duo on July 7th at a hotel in the 2600 block of South 4th Avenue. There they found drugs and four of the firearms that had been taken from the home located at the 1000 block of East Hacienda Drive. That burglary happened on July 2nd and the amount 
of firearms totals $75,000. Police need your help locating the remaining firearms in this case. If you have any information, you can call Yuma Police. A $1,000 reward is also being offered for information leading to an arrest. California teen Hannah Anderson is speaking out about her kidnapping, but doing so somewhat defensively because skeptics have posted doubts about her story on social media. Anderson sat down for an exclusive inter interview with NBC's Today, and Chris Clackham has more of what she said. But if I could get through this, I'm sure I can get through a lot more. And 16-year-old Hannah Anderson of San Diego still has a lot to go through to include burying her mother and 8-year-old brother this weekend. Plus, she's now on the defensive because of doubts about her story posted on her social media sites. I didn't know people could be so cruel. Earlier this month, Hannah was kidnapped by James DiMaggio shortly after he killed her mother and brother. But because DiMaggio was a longtime family friend and she didn't know what he had done or intended to do, she exchanged text messages with him moments before he abducted her. Because he was picking me up from cheer camp and he didn't know the address or what, like where I was. Search warrants filed by the San Diego Sheriff's Department show Hannah had also written letters to the 40-year-old DiMaggio in the past, which she says there's also a good explanation for. And the letters um, were from like a year ago when me and my mom weren't getting along very well. Me and him would talk about how to deal with it. Four horseback riders who had seen Hannah's face on TV as part of the Amber Alerts encountered her and DiMaggio in the backwood wilderness of Idaho and called the FBI. DiMaggio was killed in a subsequent gun battle. And Hannah said the main purpose of this interview is to thank her rescuers. I'd like to say thank you because without them, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Hannah's back with her father and headed back to school while investigators try to figure out what drove DiMaggio to murder the rest of her family and abduct her. Chris Clackham, NBC News. Well, you can catch more of the exclusive interview with Hannah Anderson tomorrow night on Dateline. Gold Cross ambulance strikers will be voting on an offer tomorrow regarding their pay. Teamsters 452 union president Phil Farias tells News 11 an offer has been drawn up by the company. Tomorrow, he says it will be presented to the union members for voting. Gold Cross employees have requested a pay raise along with better working equipment. No details of the offer have been revealed at this time. Of course, News 11 will have the latest on the vote. Well, embattled San Diego Mayor Bob Filner has agreed to resign as part of a deal reached with city officials if they accept a proposed settlement. For the past six weeks, 18 women have come forward accusing Filner of sexual harassment. Filner was also embroiled in an alleged pay-to-play scheme with developers. Filner was seen leaving City Hall last night with moving boxes. City Council President Todd Gloria would step in as, as acting mayor. An announcement is expected from the mayor sometime tomorrow. Then a primary special election could happen within 90 days. Well, in today's Decision 2013 report, with our local primary election only five days away, we'd like to introduce you to all of the candidates hoping to become the new mayor of Yuma. News 11's Aisha Morales sat down with the mayoral hopeful Douglas Nichols this morning to hear what he would do if he won the seat. And here's what he had to say. News 11 sat down with Douglas Nichols to hear what he would do if he became the city's new mayor. We need to expand our current jobs. We can't forget about our existing businesses because statistically 73 percent of economic growth in a community is typically from existing businesses. Nichols says he is a Yuma native and a businessman. He feels this along with a five-month term with the Yuma City Council has prepared him in several ways. There's a mix of strategies and a mix of experiences um, working with nonprofits in their budgets, working through a down economy as well as working through my own and our family budgets. I think give me a um, a wide variety of uh, experiences to pull from. Yuma, along with many parts of our country, are struggling with a high unemployment rate. Nichols says he believes this can change by focusing on our base industries like manufacturing. When we bring those in, that creates three to fourfold other jobs. It, it'll create jobs in restaurants and it'll create those jobs. Along with that, he feels our military presence is just as important. The military and their mission supported by the local government is important because otherwise when it comes time to close a base, 
um, you looked upon negatively. Campaigning as a family man, Nichols says above all, he feels the idea of community and working together is what he would focus on as mayor. It's about being a good neighbor. It's about being um, responsive and thinking about the community first, not, not ourselves or whatever else seems to come up. Mayoral candidates Raul Mendoza and Jack Kretzer are also in the race. Stay tuned tomorrow evening as Aisha sits down with Kretzer, a write-in during this year's election. The primaries could decide who takes the seat as mayor, as the winner needs 50% plus one vote to win. Well, coming up next on Nightside, as part of the Yuma Police Academy, News 11 was on hand today to see just what happens when the police SWAT team has to come in. That story is next. Stay with us. You're watching News 11. Post your